they were bleeding. It's soaking through the seat of their trousers as they're traveling on the bus. It's painful, but they heed the word of their mothers when they told them to fold into the pain. With a trembling outward breath, they direct their focus inwards. Hands cupping their lower half, fingers twitch flickering. Squeezing their eyes shut, they see a mandala of fireworks darting into each other. Lattices crisscross with each lurch of their belly, each dazzling corkscrew another twist of agony. They sniff and open their eyes to soft moonlight, diffracted by a prism of water. Blinks and all is clear. Womb jerk, gasps, faint but purposeful outward breath. Drifting now, not drowning, they'd softened and with each tsunami that broke over them, it was as if they were a piece of flotsam that moved with the tide. There was a frenetic thrill to it, even as it was starting to make them nauseous. They slept at some point, lulled by the drumbeat of blood under their eyelids. There is an ancient oak tree with knotty outer bark that stands silent in a verdant field. Their hand moves over the grooves of its trunk and prizes open a door. Entering, they discover a narrow spiral staircase and instinctively descend it. It's cool and dark, morbidly silent. A chiaroscuro of black and grey that shrinks to fit around their frame like a sarcophagus. They walk with all expectations suspended. Centuries pass, it seems, and they march onward each pad of pressure between soul and surface sending a pulse of electricity tingling up their spine. Without warning, the ground levels out and expands into impenetrable darkness. They penetrate it. A pinprick of light in the distance sparks, grows, and guides their way like a solitary star. Lurching on, they pursue the starlight, and gradually it envelops them. Bright blue with jagged crystalline walls is the cave that they now stand in. It glitches. In the center of the cave is Wai Po. Sitting serene on a tatami mat, the older woman bears an inscrutable expression on her face and an ideograph on the sole of her foot. Catching the eye of their long deceased relative, no words are exchanged, but there is a knowingness to their grandmother's gaze pupils like wormholes. They never knew each other in life, but they were familiar with the matriarch's beatific smile in family photos. Their grandma had been a warrior, a child of the old world. She'd grown up during the Dark Age Renaissance, where humanity lived enslaved to binary worship and mechanized time, had not yet even harnessed the energy of their own son. They reached for her hand, anticipating a warm, papery feeling, but Waipo disintegrates on contact. What was corporeal leaves an open void in the shape of a human in its wake, a wound. Reality like glass shards clawing back emptiness from form. They flicker out into blackness with an enormous spasm of hurt. They awake to the conductor pressing a cup gently into their open hands. Green and spongy, it's made of a biomorphic plant material that osmoses blood into its fractal pattern of cellular walls, or so they have been taught, and will be planted to germinate its seeds at the end of their cycle. They take it gratefully and push it inside their body, fingers emerging covered in bright rivulets of crimson. Smelling the copper tang, they brush it onto their trousers hastily. The conductor waits with patience, a slight smile, and guides them off the bus. They alight to find themselves amongst a sea of, mostly, women. They're stood before a forest. The visitors ambled into its dark center and they saw that the trees themselves formed a sphere-like structure. It was difficult to tell where one gnarled branch ended and another twisted root began. But harder still to believe that once, people had considered civilization separate to nature. They pushed at a clod of mud with their big toe. Alienated from their authentic vibrations by the Gregorian calendar, people had formed industries to gluttonously cannibalize the soil for fuel to power needless growth. 
excreting the resultant toxins back into their very feeding troughs in a desperate, scatological cycle of earth or addiction. All new initiates follow me, sang a voice from ahead. They leapt forward to find a khaki-robed priestess ushering a double goddess score number of young people down the opposite end of a narrow corridor where the rest of the arrivals were funneling themselves. Hot on their heels, they drift past a softly lit, metallic-scented room where a handful of creatures are finger-painting the walls with dark red, viscous liquid from a vat sat in its center. They sail beneath a proscenium arched, etched with silver moons, and into an indigo-hued auditorium. The priestess beckons them to sit and gestures towards an ornately rendered synchrometer on the wall. It showed 13 perfect moon cycles, divided into grids of 29 and a half days each. They walk to the 11th grid and trace its lines faintly with their fingers. Welcome, siblings, to the House of Blood. We meet for the first time under the auspices of the spectral serpent moon, but there will be many moons to come. As your mothers will have mentioned, you are here to bleed and bleed into the earth, feeding the earth for your first moon. Congratulations, siblings. It is a sacred gift and a potent power to wield. Together, we perform the important function of calibrating the energies of this planet, maintaining its synchronicities, and continuing to follow those in our own lives that will lead us back to it. But that's not all, of course. We are also here to complete a higher celestial mission to wean ourselves free of our addiction to the sun, chirped a dark-eyed girl next to them. Her eyes were simian-like, infinite in their knowing. Yes, smiled the priestess. We all give thanks to the light, warmth, and life force of the sun, but in so shining, our sun is inevitably dying. Here at the House of Blood, we will also be engaging in collective astral projection across the Milky Way to try and find new pathways to evolve our world from a type one to type two civilization. The initiates are called to stand one by one and bestowed with their galactic signatures. When it is their turn, the priestess pronounces the words, yellow galactic warrior, then hesitates. You have the gift of seeing, sibling, but you are inhibited somehow. That was their grandmother's galactic signature too. Waipo was one of the portals between their world and this one. She could see in many directions of time. Come with me, coaxes the priestess. They leave the auditorium and traverse the dark corridor they had crossed previously entering an atrium where there is damp earth on the ground and an open sky, allowing the moonlight to flood in. Mostly women of all ages recline, sit, squat, languish here. The priestess handles an incense burner and softly wafts its spicy oaken notes into lotus spirals of smoke. Joining a group of people on the ground, they are fed with strawberries and watered with beetroot juice wrapped in soft plant fibers. The planet had been acidifying its rising oceans, overcooking vast swathes of its land, and on the brink of deleting all complex life during its sixth mass extinction when Waipo joined the magical alliance. Their cramps begin their squeeze on their uterus again. Taking out their cup and clutching it in their fingers, they bleed freely into the earth in hot globules. The smoke levitating beneath the green canopy of the atrium cleared and the waxing crescent moon glinted through the gap in all its yellow glory. Conspirators had captured their grandma before the shift from type zero was fully manifested. The, they ran gamma waves through her brain to try and find the vibrational seed of the paradigm shift, not seeming to understand that it had no epicenter. They cried deep, gasping sobs of grief for Waipo. Their tears mingle with the blood, pooling up into a soup on the surface of the ground, all thinking suspended. They see an apparition reflected in the soup, in the shape of the woman in their dream. 
Their pain crescendos and they begin to convulse with the shock of it. Driven towards perpetual anxiety by time they had no sovereignty over, the human psyche had repressed death while obsessing over it, constantly anticipating their own imminent extinction and projecting destruction onto each other as some massive, embarrassed, cosmic cover-up. The apparition's lips move. The word fun fills their ears and their pain subsides. By the time of the first quarter moon, they turn back to look at the house of blood fondly. They feel fuller somehow. They will be back in the crystal rabbit moon with fresh psychic downloads for their sisters and siblings. New intuitive flashes of inspiration for evolving Earth into the galactic realm. Thank you. Thank you.